Hey, what's going on everyone? Welcome to Trigger Precision Machine, with episode number six of the Precision Rifle Reloading Series. Today we're out here at the range, we're getting ready to shoot our first OCW with the six Creedmoor we've been loading for for the last month. And pretty exciting day, so I have no idea how this is gonna turn out. This is a new barrel, uh, different manufacturer. The bore seems a little bit tighter than the other one based on the, the indicating rods I was using when I was chambering it but it should be pretty close. So if you remember back to the previous episodes we were talking about powdering and, and charging our cases, I went with a known powder measurement that I had from the last barrel that worked pretty well. So we used that as our max, our theoretical max, and we went down from there in uh, increments of 0.4 grains. So we're gonna get out here and shoot this right now. I have one camera downrange pointed at the target, so you guys are going to see as this happens. Now what I'm gonna do is, for the most part, this is all gonna be shot in fast motion. So you don't have to sit here and watch for 45 minutes while I shoot this test. We have 25 rounds to shoot. The first four rounds are gonna be our Fowlers. They don't mean anything at all. The barrel is fresh and clean on the six Creedmoor. Everything's been tuned, the parallax is set, have a good shooting position. We have a good target downrange with small aiming points. And we're gonna to try to be as precise as we can on this. Now, typically I use a muzzle brake or a muzzle device on this rifle. For this test, I have eliminated all of those variables, so it's just a bare muzzle. There is not even a thread protector on the end of it. So even adding a thread protector can change the harmonics of the barrel and change the point of impact. So we're trying to get the absolute most raw results that we can without any sort of influence from anything external. So we're trying to control every variable that we can. So I have the Elaborate R Chrono out there, and as we do this, I'll write down all the individual velocities for each powder charge we shoot, and that'll give us a little bit more data to go off of when we get back to the bench, we can analyze what we have. So enough talking, let's get to shooting. All right guys, I specifically waited for this time of day to shoot because there's absolutely not a breath of wind. It's really good shooting conditions right now. So I've had the Kestrel on for a few minutes. We'll go through the, the environmentals right now. It's 77.1 degrees currently. We have 41% humidity. Our pressure is, station pressure is 27.63 inches of mercury. Barometric pressure is 29.84 inches of mercury. Our, let's see. Our density altitude is right now, it's hanging out around 4,080 feet. And according to the Kestrel, we have one, zero to one miles an hour of wind, and that's from left to right. So, like I said, really good shooting conditions. And that's a, it brings up a good point, because when you run one of these tests, just like I, I mentioned a few seconds ago, we want to try to control all the variables and use our shooting environment to our favor. So it's advantageous for our testing process. So we don't have to worry about wind skewing our results or um, excessive heat if your barrel's getting too hot. It's pretty moderate out right now, really good conditions. So what I'm gonna do is as I shoot, I'll take my shot and every time I will let the rifle rest for about a minute. So I vary that time that it rests and that's just to keep the barrel from getting too hot. If we run through all these things real fast, you'd have a scorching hot barrel, we don't want that. So just another variable that we can we can control. And on the larger calibers, like some of the smaller 30 calibers, like 308 and stuff like that, I might let it rest a minute and a half to two minutes. On the larger big boomers, like the 300 Norma, those guys get to rest like three minutes between shots. And it's all dictated based on the environment. If you go out and shoot in the middle of winter when it's 30 degrees out, then you might not have to wait that long. Maybe a minute would suffice. But in conditions like today, I'd probably let the 300 Norma rest for a three minute period before I shot the next round. So we have our rounds down there. I have the four Fowlers already in the magazine and we'll, uh, the scope's been taken on and off of this rifle so it is not accurately zeroed. So we'll use these first four rounds to foul the barrel and get on paper and figure out where our point of impact is.
All right, guys, this is the first round of the first charge weight. So this is the lowest charge that we have, the first round. And for whatever reason, the lab radar is not picking up any shots. So now we'll let it rest a minute and we'll shoot our first round from the second series of shots. You guys will notice every time I shoot, I check the head on the brass. So we're looking for flattened primers, so the edges of the primers where it's radius, those things will get flattened out flush with the head of the case if you're running too high a pressure. We're also looking for ejector swipes and any sort of other abnormalities on the head of the case. And these look perfect. There's no, no pressure signs at all. Granted, this is our second highest powder charge, so we'll see how we do when we get towards the top end of this. And the chronograph decided to work. So that was our fourth charge from the bottom. So that puts us at 42.2 grains and it's reading 3,039 feet per second. So with this rifle prior to uh, the barrel change, I was running these 115 D tacks right around 3,050, maybe a little bit hotter. So we're approaching that mark and I found that speed to work really well with these bullets. And at long range, the thing is absolutely a monster. So there we are. That's right at our target velocity on our fifth from our lowest powder charge, which is uh, 42.6 grains. And we're getting 3,059. That's exactly where I want to be. There's zero pressure, pressure signs on the head of the case. They look great. And uh, so far, what I'm seeing down range is very consistent points of impact as we progress through the, the charge weight. So, so far we're looking very good. We'll give her another 30 seconds or so, and we'll give a give our sixth round a go. All right guys, that was our second to last round at 43 grains. That was the load that I shot out of my last barrel and that was 3,050 feet per second. And uh, zero pressure signs, the primers still look good. They're starting to get a little bit of a, an ejector swipe, but it's really hard to see. So we'll give the, the next one a try. And this is our top load. This is 43.4 grains. All right, so that one had a little heavy bolt lift and the chrono didn't pick up a reading on it, but and I'll take a picture of this later. This one has a pretty hefty, pretty hefty ejector swipe and uh, flattened out primer and the primer's actually starting to flow back into the, the firing pinhole. So this would be a good example of where we wanna stop. And I'll throw some pictures of this case setup in the video right now. All right, so that does it for our first round. That was one shot from each of the subsequently increasing powder charges for our OCW test. I waited roughly maybe 45 seconds to a minute on each of those. Uh, made sure we had uh, as accurate and as good of a shooting position as I can build. And the next thing we're gonna do is, well, first off, we're gonna wait for maybe two or three minutes, let the barrel cool off. It's not hot to the touch or really anything, but each one of these rows that I shoot, I like the barrel to kind of be similar to how it is when we start the previous row. So we only shot four rounds through the barrel before we started our first round of the OCW test. So the barrel wasn't even warm at all. So we'll let it cool down just a little bit and we'll get back at it. 
All right, guys, we're back. I gave it a full five minutes to cool off. So it should be, it's nice and cool. It's not even warm to the touch. So it's just about like how we started that first uh, round of our OCW. So let's go through the second round and we'll reshoot each of those targets with the corresponding round. And we'll start to see our uh, points of impact and how they're shifting through these gradually increasing powder charges. All right, guys, so that was it. Pretty simple, right? So pretty boring when you do it the right way because you ideally you need to wait between one and three minutes in between shots. Try to let that barrel cool down quite a bit after each series, and it just helps with your consistency because as we all know, as the barrel gets hot, your point of impact can shift due to the thermal expansion and contraction of the barrel as it heats and cools. So that will have a drastic effect on where your point of impact is if you let your barrel get too hot. So let's go down range down. We'll check out our target. We have uh, all 25 rounds shot and I have the point of impact just slightly low. So we weren't blowing out our point of aim. And uh, it looks from the scope, it looks like the results were pretty good. It looks like there's a, a trackable pattern as the point of impact shifts throughout each powder charge. And hopefully we'll have some good results here to fine tune next week when we do a seating depth test. And then after that, we're gonna top it all off with tuning this rifle in with a harmonic tuner at the end of it. We have a brand new Harrell's tuner and I'm super excited to get this thing on there because in my experience with those tuners, it takes a good rifle and it makes it better. It can never make a, a bad rifle good, but it does make a good rifle better if you know how to tune it properly. So we're gonna get after that here next week, but for now, let's go check our target. All right, guys, here we are. Let's check our workout. So starting at the top left, that's our lowest powder charge, three shots there. And then at the bottom left, that's our highest powder charge. And there are two, two rounds in that hole right there. And then there's that one flyer down below. But the, everything shot pretty good. I'm gonna have to call this one a flyer right there. I had just a really bad jerk on the trigger and I felt it and I called that one back at the the shooting location but overall really good groups good consistency from each powder charge and this is something that we can definitely work on and once again not based on just group size but just the location maybe the average center location for each three shots on these two is pretty darn close so that's the 43 grain load that shot really well out of my last barrel and I mean, a lot of these groups are pretty good. We can tune those in and we'll probably reduce those by half, I would say, by the time we're done with this. This is just the first round of tuning, so not bad at all. All right, guys, we're back in the shop now. All we have to do is analyze our target and figure out what powder charge we wanna use for our seeding depth test. The way we do this is we look at each one of our groups. Now, just to reiterate the way the test works is those groups were shot in what Dan Newberry calls the round robin fashion. So we shoot our lowest powder charge on its own target, and then we transition to a new target, shoot the next higher powder charge, and we continue that until we've shot one of each of the powder charges for our low development test. We let the barrel rest five minutes to cool off. Then we repeated that, starting at the lowest powder charge and progressing until we hit the highest powder charge. Rest again, and then we shot that one more time. So we have three impacts on each target that are the same powder charge. So now what we wanna do is we wanna analyze each of those targets. And we start by triangulating the impact holes. So if you have a hole, follow my fingers, if you have a hole up here, a hole over here, and a hole down here, we can draw a perfect triangle 
with those three impacts. And what you wanna do is you wanna find the average center, so wherever the center of that triangle is of those impacts and mark that on your target. And that is the point that we're going to compare for all of our subsequent groups. So let's take a look at what we got. When you guys see this, it'll make a little bit more sense. And I got the target right here. All right, now I got the target in the frame. So we'll go ahead and we'll start here at the upper left-hand corner. I have the grains of powder for each of these groups written at the top, starting with 41.0 grains. And I also have the group size. Now, don't get carried away with, with worrying about the group size for this test. So that's what we tune in on the following tests. So what we wanna do is we wanna take our three impacts here and try to triangulate them the best we can. Now these three rounds for this first group are essentially in one long hole. So what I will generally do is I'll place my little red Sharpie mark right there that denotes the average center of these three groups, or these three shots rather, and, and kind of favor towards the heavy side. So we have two shots down here and just this one up here. So I'm gonna say our average point of impact is right there at my little red mark. You can see the tip of the pin on it right now. So then we go to the 41.4 grain group. The group shrunk a little bit to 478. And this was a pretty easy group to triangulate. So we had these, uh, this first round up here and followed by these two rounds that are low. So again, estimate our average point of impact to be somewhere right around here. All right, so we go down to our 41.8 grain group. Group stays just over half inch at 585. I had this flyer right here. I think this group would have been smaller, but I called that at the range at the time of the shot. Not sure what happened, but nonetheless, we can still triangulate our group. So another easy one to triangulate, but I estimate the average point of impact right there, just to the, let's say 10 o'clock of our two impacts here. So right where the tip of the pin is right now is what I'm calling the average point of impact. Then we go to 42.2 grains. The group shrinks to 518, pretty decent group for just this first round of testing. And I estimated our average point of impact right there, just below our top two holes. We go down to 42.6 grains, and we have another decent group, 544. We have one just north of our point of aim, and we have two below, so I averaged our point of impact right there, just six o'clock below our point of aim. Coming to 43.0 grains, this is ironic because this was the accuracy load for my previous barrel. I expected some pressure signs at this powder charge and I didn't get anything that would stop me from shooting pressure or stop me from shooting this, this load. But anyways, our group shrunk to 365 and our point of impact or our average point of impact is just 11 o'clock of our point of aim. It's very close. And then we come down to the 43.4 grain group and we have two in that one ragged hole right there. And we have our final round down here and that group averaged out at 820 and our average point of impact is again just north of our point of aim. All right guys, now all that's left to do is we have to find our optimal charge weight. So what we wanna do is we wanna compare all of these average points of impact. And I, I just call them that, it's something that I came up with. It isn't maybe correct. Um, Dan Newberry might call them something else, but I call them the average point of impact. So we wanna find two or three in a row, ideally three that are very similar with their average points of impact. So if we look at 41.0, we have that impact right there, or that average right there. This one over here, it's just maybe 100 thousandths to the right of this one. And then we go down to our third, and this one's maybe 100 thousandths to the left of this one. So overall, if you were to measure the difference between these three, you're around a quarter of an inch, which is pretty good. It tells me that if I pick maybe the middle one here, this 41.4 grain load, I could probably tune that in and it's gonna be a pretty pressure tolerant load. So if the pressure goes up in the load for whatever reason and goes to our, let's say pressure levels of the 41.8 grain load due to temperature or something else, then our point of impact is gonna be pretty similar. Our velocity might go up, but our point of impact is gonna be pretty similar. And then we go down so if your pressure goes down for whatever reason, then our point of impact is still gonna be pretty similar. So then we go to our next series of shots and our point of impact is still pretty close to this one right here. It's kind of favoring the left edge of the target or the left side of the target and it's still south of our point of aim right there. So then we go down here and what we see is our average point of aim 
jumps towards the center pretty drastically. So it starts creeping up there a little bit and up here it's just maybe a hundred thousandths short or south of our point of aim. In this one, we're maybe, geez, I don't know, maybe a hundred thousandths, 11 o'clock of our point of aim. That one's really close. And then this one is also up there, very, very similar to, to this one almost. So just maybe 50 thousandths or so to the left of our previous group right there. So this is kind of where I want to play because first off, this is giving me the velocity that I, I want. And if I recall correctly, we got one good chronograph reading. And by the way, I figured out what was wrong with the uh, lab radar and the batteries were super low on it. So I'm surprised it barely turned on, but our 42.6 grand load right here got us 3,059 feet per second. And that's right where I want to be. But this 43.0 grain load was a little bit more accurate and I didn't get a velocity for it, but it still has a very similar point of impact with the previous load. So the 43.4 grain load was a little hot. I was getting hard bolt lift on one. I got ejector swipes on all three and flattened primers on all three. 43.0, I had eh, maybe a light ejector swipe on one and no other signs on the other two, which tells me it's right there on the ragged edge of being too hot. So if I shot this in you know, 110 degree heat, I might have some issues. So I'm probably gonna stay around here with this 42.6 grain load for our final test, and that's gonna be our seating depth test. So we might split the difference here and what I'll typically do sometimes if um, I see that our middle load is maybe right on the ragged edge of pressure like this one is, then I'll bump it down, maybe, I don't know, eh, we'll go down 0.2 grains and maybe try 42.8 for our seeding depth test. So that'll kind of keep us within this average point of impact with that small of a, an increment, or uh, I'm sorry, an increment in change over this 42.6 grain load. I wouldn't expect results much, much uh, worse than this or much better than this. It should be very, very similar. So I think that's where we'll go. We'll try 42.8, um, maybe 42.6, I'm not sure, but it still looks really good. I mean, these are all really, really close. So especially these four, but we are not touching the 43.4 grain load. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the danger zone where we don't wanna be and that's rough on brass. So that's that, you guys. So we'll go and we will, I think we'll circle our 42.6 grain load and the 544 group that's center to center from the two holes that are furthest apart. So that one to that one, center to center, not a bad group by any means, but I typically get these things down to around 300 thousandths. And that's after all the testing, some fine tuning and tweaking and possibly um, some changes to the rifle if I need to. But this is this is a really good start. This is a better start than what I will have on some of the larger calibers like the uh, 300 Norma, those groups that I start out, they're usually around three quarters of an inch to maybe an inch, and then we get them shrunk way down, but it's a much more temperamental cartridge than the six Creedmoor, so this is what I expected. Everything is around a half of an inch with the exception of our final group, and that was high pressure. So I'm pretty happy with this, and I'm pretty confident that we can get these groups down to our 300 thousandths range, kind of looking like this over here. And that's typically what I like. And we'll shoot some five shot groups and 10 shot groups next and we'll, uh, we'll kind of analyze it from there and see if we need to make any other changes. But I think we're doing good. So that is that. All right guys, so that wraps up our optimal charge weight test for the six millimeter Creedmoor. Great results I think. That'll give us a good place to start to tune that load in to shoot really tight and consistent groups. I wish the chrono was working so we would have had at least an idea of where we're at at the top end of things and the bottom end. But we had two chrono readings which is, I mean, it's better than nothing. So we'll go with that and next time we'll try to get the chrono up and working so we have that data as well, which is super important in my opinion. Just wanted to touch on a couple things before I let you guys go for the weekend. First off, as you saw, there is no magic, there is no wizardry, no voodoo, nothing behind this load development stuff. All it is is being consistent, being methodical, and being analytical about what you do. So when we're reloading, be consistent. When we're out there shooting, be methodical about how you set up and how you pull the trigger every single time. And then when you're analyzing your target, obviously, 
the analytical. Look what's going on downrange. Everything that we put into our rifle has an effect on our, our shots downrange. So if you change something on your rifle, if you change a bipod, if you change a muzzle brake, a thread protector, or anything else like that is going to have some sort of effect on your rifle. So next time you go out and shoot, let's say you change bipods, and I used to have a really discernible difference in my group sizes when I was shooting a Harris bipod versus a uh, BNT bipod, one of the Atlas bipods. So the Atlas bipod had a lot larger spread of my group than the Atlas bipod did. So I switched bipods and sure enough, it tightened the groups up like probably 50%. Uh, so just certain things like that. So if your rifle opens up, be analytical about what happens or be analytical about what you did to the rifle or you didn't do. So if your barrel's starting to get really fouled up, then maybe that's a sign you need to do, to do a, a real nice cleaning on it. So that's just one thing you guys don't get frustrated by this process at all. If it doesn't work out the first time, just you're getting good data no matter what. So at the very least, you might get some chrono data if this first test has failed, and then you go do it again. It's only 25 rounds and it's fun to go shoot. So um, when you're doing it, I can't stress the importance enough of being consistent with how long you wait in between shots. I've done this before where I was in a hurry and I rushed everything and I shot you know one full uh, row of rounds in, I don't know, probably two or three minutes. I had some pretty bad heat problems and granted that heavy M24 contour barrel and six Creedmoor doesn't have a lot of heat shift, but there's still some, and that's going to affect your results. So again, be methodical about what you do and how you handle this stuff and pay attention to what's going on. In the past, I've actually brought a laser uh, infrared thermometer out there and checked the barrel in a couple places. And I actually waited until it was within five degrees of the previous shot. So everything was consistent across the board. How we did it yesterday was, was good enough in my opinion. That the barrel never got too warm to not touch. It was just about perfect. So we waited one minute in between shots and then we waited five minutes in between the different rows. So that allowed the barrel to cool down quite a bit. All right guys, we have to talk about barrel harmonics a little bit before we leave for the day because that's a very important aspect of this test. So when we pull the trigger, there's a sequence of events that happens that causes the barrel to move or oscillate. So we have our primer ignition, we have our powder combustion, and we have the bullet traveling down the barrel and exiting the barrel. As the barrel is moving, and it doesn't matter if you're shooting a truck axle, one and a quarter straight bull barrel or a sporter type barrel, the barrel is going to move. So it varies in degrees of how much it moves based on the cartridge, the, the ignition, and all these other things. Uh, the length of the barrel affects it. Everything affects that oscillation of the barrel. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to find that sweet spot of the oscillation where we have several bullet or several powder weights that allow the bullet to exit the barrel at that same general area of our oscillation. And that's what we saw, especially with the first three groups that we shot from that OCW test. We had three average points of impact that were probably under a quarter inch from each other. So that tells me that if you pick that middle load, first off, it's gonna be very pressure tolerant as we discussed, so you can go high or low and still have a good average point of impact. But what that means, what that's telling us is though all three of those loads are exiting in the barrel at a very similar point in that harmonic oscillation. And then we saw some slight movement for the subsequent four uh, powder charges which is fine because we had a, a pretty consistent point of impact for three or four of those as well. But that's what we're looking for and that's what we're trying to do with this test. So like I mentioned before, you might have an increase or a decrease in velocity, but at least the barrel is going to be in the same or a similar location as that bullet exits each time with these uh, charges. So a very important aspect of this and Again, it's one of those things that we can, we have full and complete control over, and this test gives us a lot of good data to look at. Dan Newberry says not to get uh, bowled over by the small groups, but it's still nice to kind of see and get a general frame of reference for how the rifle's shooting, because then you can use that for the following test, the seating depth test, et cetera, to kind of figure out how good you can get it and what your, what your potential is. So, Really interesting stuff, you guys. And again, 
I'm gonna direct you guys to Dan Newberry. He is the father of the OCW test. He knows more about it. He's probably forgotten more about it than I know. I've used this for a long, long time and great results. So stop by his website. I'll post a link to it in the comments section or in the, uh, the description of the video down below. And that's it for today. Hope you guys have a good rest of your weekend and we will see you next week with uh, another great shooting test. So thanks guys. Thank you.